and the angels of darkness descended on pinions of fire and light, the great and terrible dark angels. From an ancient Calibanite fable. Shortly after the success of the campaign against the Great Beast in 846 M30, the Emperor of Mankind and a small band of his Legiones Astartes scouts drawn from the First Legion arrived on Caliban after they detected the psychic emanations of one of the Primarchs. From the moment the Emperor first landed, L. Johnson felt the deep connection between himself and the Master of Mankind and swore his fealty. In return, the Emperor made him the commander of the first legion of space marines that had been created from his genome. The Emperor had launched his great crusade after the end of old night to reunite all the lost colonies of humanity and restore mankind's birthright as the rulers of the galaxy. His space marine legions purged entire star systems of humanity's Xenos oppressors. As the Imperium's wave of conquest advanced across the galaxy, Imperial scouts brought word that they had rediscovered the isolated world of Caliban in the Segmentum Obscurus and that it was home to a man who was likely one of the missing Primarchs. Only a small honor guard of the First Legion would accompany the Emperor to Caliban, for the Legion was still scattered to war zones across the front lines of the Great Crusade. A mere 500, mostly veterans of the Host of Death, would precede the Master of Mankind as he journeyed to greet his lost son, the Knight of Caliban known as the Lion. Arrayed in the jet black power armor and mortuary symbols that had come to be their mark, it seemed as if the old tales of Calibanite legend and myth had come to life, a host of dark angels mustering before the stronghold of the Order and kneeling before Lion L. Johnson. In that initial fateful encounter, the Legion would earn a new title from the first of the Primarchs, for he saw fit to test the mettle of his new followers by personally dueling the captain of the company. The Lion stood against the Cataphracti armored warrior and matched his Calibanite steel to the power field wreath blade of his opponent and left him wounded in the dust. The Lion took their measure, and they his, and both learned the respect for the other. From that day forth, the Primarch would call the Astartes of the First Legion his Dark Angels, a title that soon spread throughout the Legion. Within a short span of time, the Emperor arrived at the Order's Fortress Monastery to reclaim his lost Jean son in person and induct Caliban formally into the Imperium of Man, its vast forests to be cleared for industry and the first types of recruits claimed from among its population to replenish the depleted ranks of the First Legion. The day of his arrival was one that would live on for centuries in Calibanite legend. His great vessel descended from the heavens and he welcomed his lost son back into the Imperial fold. 
The event was slightly marred by an attempt against the Emperor's life made by certain conservative knights of the order who feared the changes that would be wrought to their world by the Imperium and its advanced science and culture. But these malcontents were swiftly and mercilessly executed as traitors by the Astartes. The first legion's governing council of masters on distant Grammarai would soon hear of Lion L. Johnson, the man who was their Primarch, and once more they were riven by dissension. Though none would doubt the word of the Emperor that this Knight of Colorban was their true lord, they were split by shame and pride. Some were stricken by remorse at the state of the legion their Primarch would inherit, while others wished to set forth and bring a suitable victory as a trophy to set at the feet of their new master. All across the galaxy, the dispersed units of the First Legion reacted much the same, some detachments redoubling their efforts and throwing themselves into combat with renewed zeal to bring honor to the Legion, while others sought to extricate themselves from their campaigns so they might travel to Caliban and ask forgiveness of their returned Primarch. The lion himself was brought to Tara by the Emperor, that he might learn of the war the Master of Mankind wished him to prosecute, and of the role he would play for the Imperium in the years yet to come. Soon, the Space Marines of the First Legion, who had accompanied the Emperor to Caliban, were putting potential Astartes aspirants from the Order and the other knightly organizations through myriad martial trials and competitions to gauge their level of martial prowess and character. Only the strongest and most dedicated were allowed to pass to the next stage. Many within the Order whispered that they were competing for a place within the ranks of the Astartes, but these trials also served the secondary purpose of determining if the human strain on Caliban was genetically pure enough to warrant its status as a world that the First Legion could recruit from in the coming years. While the Calibanite knightly orders reveled in their differences and often resorted to combat to settle their feuds, the Space Marine Legions were united in purpose and will. Such division could not be tolerated, and at the behest of the Lion and the Dark Angels, the individual knightly orders were disbanded and brought under the control of the First Legion. Such a drastic move did not happen overnight, and could not pass without dissenting voices. But when the Lion spoke in favor of the Union of Knights, and the glory that would be theirs for the taking in the service of the Emperor, most such voices were stilled. Most, but not all. More objections were raised when the soldiers of the Imperial Army descended to the surface of Caliban. The First Legion's aspirant trials had already identified the likely candidates for recruitment into that august body, but the vast majority of the planet's population would still be able to serve the Emperor as troops of the Imperial Army. Within an unimaginable short period of time, the surface of Caliban was transformed from a world of sprawling wilderness and castles 
to one of martial industry that rang to the beat of factory hammers and the tramp of booted feet as its populace girded itself for interstellar war. The Emperor's servants had descended to Caliban with enormous earth-moving machines that cleared dozens of kilometers of forests a solar day and left flat, lifeless soil in their wake, ready to be planted or built upon. Mines, refineries, and manufactoria followed, ready to transform the planet's abundant resources into vital war material for the Emperor's crusade. Cities were built to supply the sprawling industrial sites, growing upwards and outwards with each passing Tehran year as the traditional villages and towns surrounding the fortress monasteries were emptied and their citizens relocated to better serve the Imperium. Finally, the day arrived when those individuals whose courage had been proven beyond doubt, whose stamina, endurance, and strength had seen them through the Astartes trials, were ready to be added to the ranks of the First Legion. Word had come from Luther that the Astartes had made their final selection for advanced training and the gene enhancement required to join their ranks. Through the application of imperial science and the marvels of the gene seed, these aspirants were transformed over the next several standard years into battle brothers of the First Legion, the newly renamed Dark Angels. Luther had also been chosen to join, but in common with a large proportion of that initial intake from the Order and the other Calibanite knightly orders, he had been too old to benefit from the implantation of gene seed. In its place, he and others like him had undergone an extensive series of genetic, surgical, and biochemical enhancement procedures designed to increase their strength, stamina, and reflexes to superhuman levels. They were taller, stronger, and quicker than mortal men, but still, they were no true Astartes. It was difficult for Luther and the others to come to terms with that fact, knowing that they were surrounded by those who had once served under them as squires and junior knights, but were now far more powerful than they could ever hope to become. Luther still served as the Lion's second within the Legion, earning his position based on merit and fuel with a desire to prove himself by his devotion to the Imperial ideal. But despite his successes, he could not escape his own inner conviction that he was somehow being looked down upon because he was not a full Astartes. As for Lion L. Johnson, his brother Primarchs would come to call him dour and morose, given to dark moods and heedless of the counsel of others. But he saw things simply and starkly. He learned on Tala that the war he had fought in Caliban's monster-haunted forests had not been ended, but only begun for the galaxy teemed with monsters to be slain. He dedicated himself to one task, killing. He had no time for sanguineous chivalric ideals, for Mortarion's arbitrary hatreds or Fulgrim's obsession with beauty. Such passion only obfuscated the true goal, 
that the enemies of mankind should be destroyed. As the first of all the Primarchs created by the Emperor, he was both more and less than his brothers, a primal force of destruction whose single-minded focus wrought him more inhuman than even Magnus the Red. The Lion could stand against any of his kin, match blades with Fulgrim, and stalemate the strategies of Robut Giaman, and though some might exceed him in the details of some tasks, there were none that were his equal in the grander scope of battle, none whose will could match the bloody-minded determination of the Lion. His talons and resolute confidence, which some might have called arrogance, won him few friends, but saw him placed at the head of his legion faster than any of the Primarchs to be rediscovered before him. And the legion he inherited was in sore need of its Primarch and in need of a new beginning. Scattered and fractured, the First Legion remained a powerful fighting force, but one whose purpose had become lost in the long years of the Great Crusade. Before the coming of the Primarch, they had been mentors and guides for the younger legions, but their students had long since found their own wisdom. Now, Lionel Johnson would grant them a new purpose, one in keeping with the Primarch's own methods and the vision he had for the Emperor's Great Crusade. His first acts were to merge many of the teachings of Caliban's techno-feudal aristocracy with those of the First Legion's Hexagrammaton, fusing the best of Tala and Caliban to create something new and more refined and to gather the scattered fragments of his legion together. With the first generations of recruits taken from the ranks of the worthy among the Knights of Caliban still undergoing implantation of the gene seed, hypnogogic indoctrination, and live fire training, the lion prepared to embark on a crusade of his own. With him were to be found the original 500 warriors that had first arrived at Caliban, as well as those chapters and battle groups that had sought him out to pledge their allegiance, as well as auxilia companies raised from the stock of Caliban to serve the Imperial Army, and a small retinue of Mechanicum Magi from the forge world of Xana too, eager to court favor with the new Primarch. In full, they numbered 20,000 warriors, perhaps a third of the legion, each marked by the new beginning they were pledged to, adorned with the winged sword of Lion L. Johnson's dark angels instead of the grim marks of an age now ended. The Lion led this host for seeking out those companies of his gene sons that had not yet found their way to his side, to find those scattered warriors amid the chaos of the Great Crusade, a war waged across a galaxy by ten billion warriors under arms, was no small feat and made possible only by the genius of the Lion himself and the art of the tech adepts of Xana, who quickly passed the data banks of the Divisio Militaris to discern in which campaigns the First Legion bled and died. For any other legion, the arrival of their newly rediscovered Primarch might have been the cause for raucous celebration or ostentatious parade, but not so for the Grim First. 
News of Lionel Johnson's approach most often spur the warriors of the First Legion to redouble their efforts in battle, throwing themselves upon the foe without care for their survival, so that when they stood before their Jean father, they might offer him the blood-soaked laurels of victory. Each battle-worn company received their new master with the same stoic reserve, with silent curtsy and brief but solemn vows of allegiance, and each was tested in battle by the Primarch himself before they joined the ranks of his growing entourage. As was the way of the lion, he demonstrated his worth by his actions and skill, rather than with words and vague promises, allowing those who might doubt him to match their blades against his in honest combat. None among the Legion could question his right to lead after such a trial, though some few harbored misgivings at the sudden changes he brought to the centuries-old doctrines of the Legion and the shift in authority he represented. Within a few short standard years, the Lion had gathered the vast majority of his Legion together, near a hundred thousand warriors, and led them to the ancient stronghold on Grammarai. There, the gathered council of masters and preceptors conclave awaited him amid the many glories of the First Legion's long and glorious history and the amassed wisdom distilled from its battles. Here, surrounded by the dusty trophies of the past, Lionel Johnson made his Legion whole once again. He faced the ceremonial champion of the Council of Masters in the Ring of Honor, battling Pyrus Kalagad, the Master of the Host of Fire, in an hour-long duel that has since become legend. This final trial ended, the Primarch accepted the titles of Grand Master of the First Legion, the Six Wings of the Hexagrammaton, and High Preceptor of the Orders Militant of the First Legion, the first warrior to consolidate the leadership of the entire Legion under one banner. To the gathered warriors of the Dark Angels, whose oaths had now been sworn in blood and sacrifice, the new Primarch swore an oath of his own, an oath to seal the pact between them. This oath is recorded in the books of the Council of Masters. We are the Angels of Darkness. For us, there is no peace, no end but war and death. We shall not walk in the golden halls of mankind's future, but stand resolute in the shadows beyond. While we yet draw breath, this Imperium will not fall, and we will not know defeat, for I pledge every warrior every drop of blood in the Legion in the name of victory, no matter the cost. The Reorganization of the First Legion with his oath to his legion sworn, Lion L. Johnson saw the rise of his Dark Angels, placing new masters over each of the wings he had created from the bones of the legion's old hosts and formalizing its various informal orders in the style of Caliban's knightly orders. With the first influx of new recruits from Caliban now ready to join the Legion, comprising those older warriors like Luther that had opted to undergo the painful and unreliable cybernetic and genetic augmentic enhancement process that allowed them to reach levels of ability comparable to true space marines, Lionel Johnson swiftly incorporated them within this new structure, 
taking care to assign posts and commands based only on merit and not due to origin or the simple virtue of time in service. A number of the lion's old companions from the Order found positions within his inner circle, and despite the stringent trials he insisted upon, some of them were less than pleased to yield their authority to these comparative newcomers. The old Grand Legion Chantrion Grammarai was torn down, replaced with a more modest fortress to secure the industrial sprawl of that world, for although the Legion would maintain a great fortress monastery on Caliban, its true heart and seat of power would be the sanctum of its Primarch aboard his flagship, the ancient Gloriana-class battleship Invincible Reason. For many, this reinvigoration of the Legion served to dispel the malaise that had long lain over the first, discarding the vain glory that had sapped the worth from victory and embracing the purity of the Primarch's vision. Though for a silent minority of veterans, the sudden and jarring dissolution of old traditions and the introduction of new Calibanite blood left a lingering sense of doubt. The Lion chose to confront any intransigence with the stoic indifference that was his hallmark, choosing to immerse the Legion in war and trust that his example would dispel any doubt. Dispersed under the Masters and Knight Commands of the Legion, he set the Dark Angels to their task while the Primarch led his own fleet to answer a call for aid received only recently by the newly installed Astropathic Quad Caliban. His destination was the distant world of Carcassam, where the Ultramarines garrison there had resisted siege for over eight solar months after a sudden uprising against Imperial rule among the population living within the ruined halls of the shattered World Fortress. The desperate rebels had opened hidden vaults deep beneath the surface of the planet and set loose a biogenic phage that had reshaped the broken people of their world into twisted, blood-hungry ghouls whose minds were burned clean of all thought except the need to hunt and kill. These monstrous mutant creations then fell upon the unsuspecting warriors of the 13th Legion with a ferocity that gave pause to even the warriors of the Legiones Astartes. With much of the Great Crusade's strength concentrated to the Galactic East, there were few forces available to relieve the beleaguered Ultramarines and, given the history of Kagasam, few expected the Dark Angels to return. So, when the Invincible Reason broke through the Immaterium and entered real space, its drop bays already open and prime for launch, Praetor Arteon of the 13th, the commander of the all but overrun Astartes garrison, lost for a moment the famous stoic reserve of the Ultramarines and cried out for joy at the sight. The lion himself was at the forefront of the relief force, cutting a path through the teeming hordes of flesh ghouls that threatened to overrun the Ultramarines. At the head of a thousand ebon-armored veterans of the Dread Wing, the new master of the First Legion made swift work of the foe. A curtain of superheated plasma scouring clean the walls and bunkers of the Ultramarines' fortress. 
At his heels came the full force of the fleet, 10,000 transhuman warriors of the Dark Angels, and by their blades was the enemy put to rout and then annihilated as they cowered in their bolt holes. When the Ultramarines sallied forth from their fortifications to meet them among the sea of corpses and ash, they did so with some trepidation, perhaps expecting some measure of retribution for the last meeting between their legions at Kargasam, or a demand to cede the world to the First Legion in return for their aid. Yet the lion had no interest in old grudges or the tawdry business of accolades and honors, and with the killing complete, he left without fanfare, leaving behind only an empty banner to mark the Dark Angel's debt to the Ultramarines paid. That this was among his first battles was no accident but a statement of his intent. He was not to play at politics, not to build empires, nor monuments. He was pledged to war and death, to kill the enemies of the Emperor and nothing else. And so it was, with this doctrine in mind, that Lion L. Johnson and his Dark Angels took up their duties in the latter days of the Great Crusade.